Let's bow our heads from our, if we can, for a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, Lord, you gather us here in your house this day. The winds blowing outside, the cold air remind us of the harshness of life in this world. Lord, we suffer, we struggle each day, and we're tempted to doubt and question your goodness to us. Lord, we are so surrounded by so many things that we can become fearful and scared, anxious about what lies ahead. And yet you, our King, went to the cross and rose from the grave so that we knew we would know the peace that we would have in you. Lord, help us today to cherish that peace, to live that peace, knowing that you are with us always, even to the edge, end of the age. So I ask now, Lord, to be the words of my mouth and the meditations of all the hearts that are gathered here together, that we would be and abide in your presence. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, grace, mercy, and peace be unto all of you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's nice having Abby back home. She got back Thursday night, Friday morning, really, about one in the mornings when we made it back. But having her home reminds me of a story. Because when she was seven years old, she made one of the most profound observations there are in the Christian church. Now, it was us living in Hawaii on the island of Oahu. It was Father's Day weekend. And I had never been around to visit other churches. And so on Saturday, I thought, I'll go to one of the Saturday services in another church to kind of see how they worship, to kind of know some of our other brothers on the island. So I asked the family, who wants to go with me on a Saturday service? The answer was zero. But it was Father's Day, so Rachel nudges Abby, and Abby goes, well, I'll go with you, Dad. And it was an experience for her. We went into this non-denominational church, and there was lots of music, and it was loud music. She let me know, it's really loud. But then she made some acute observations that I'll never forget. Things that Christian churches have in common. The first was this, that every church reads from the Bible, because as she says, that's how God talks to us. The second one is that all churches pray the same prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, because that's how Jesus taught us to pray. The third is that all churches have a cross, because that's where Jesus died. And the reason why I mention this is because in this church that day, not one of those things were present. There was a cross, but it was way up in the corner in the dark, and she had to find it. And she had a way of asking these questions when everything became silent, so it was a little uh, embarrassing for the father. But I started to think about it. Is that what my daughter sees in the cross? Death? Let me ask you, what do you see when you look at the cross of Jesus? Do you see death as well? I mean, believers around the world gather on Sunday mornings and on Saturdays around the cross. Why? Because it unites us. This is how the Apostle Paul writes it. He says, For in him... All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, on earth and in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now, in today's gospel lesson, we see a group of people gathered around the cross of Jesus. We see religious leaders and soldiers and even criminals there. Now, what do they see in the cross? Well, I can tell you, they all saw the same thing. They saw Jesus Christ, the failure. Not the man who lived up to the sign above his head that said, King of the Jews. Now, first you have those religious leaders at the foot of the cross. Now, they had read the scriptures, and they had studied them, and they knew him well. But they missed the point. You see, they were waiting for the coming Messiah, the Christ to come. And deliver them from their Roman oppressors. But then they saw Jesus hanging on the cross. And they said, this is not the conqueror that we've been waiting for. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And what did Jesus do? Nothing. In their eyes, what a failure. And then there were the soldiers. 
they mocked Jesus too. I mean, they watched this other pretender king who was brought to his knees under the power of the Roman Empire. They played the part of butlers, divvying up his clothes, bringing him sour wine, saying, oh, hail king, if you're so powerful, show us. You think you're greater than Caesar? Oh, yeah, come on down. We'll believe you then. But what did Jesus do? Nothing. And so in their eyes, he was a failure. Now, if it wasn't enough for the taunts of the religious leaders or the soldiers, Jesus had to endure the insults of the criminal hanging next to him. Now, he wanted something from Jesus. He wanted salvation. But not an eternal salvation. He wanted a physical one right now. He wanted Jesus to end his suffering. And so his taunt gets personal. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and, and me. And again, Jesus does nothing. What a failure. So I pause here because I want to ask, which group of those people do you see yourself being a part of? I hope you would say, none of them, right? I mean, not like those soldiers who saw Christ as a joke. Although, let's be honest, in our world today, most people see Christianity as a joke, as foolishness, as that which is for the, the weak. Thanks to medical advancements in science and technology, the idea of a supreme divine being creating everything just seems like a fairy tale to so many. Or I wonder this, how many of us spend more time reading our social media or trusting Google than we do reading the scriptures and trusting God's word? How many of us will trust the diagnosis and the progression, or the, 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 the words of a doctor over going to our Heavenly Father in prayer and trusting his healing touch? And I hope none of us find ourselves with the religious leaders or even that criminal on the cross. I mean, they were looking for Jesus to give them a better life or to take away their suffering and their anguish. And yet they see him dying on the cross. Now, most of us here are not in as bad of a situation as that criminal. Right, Bunky? I mean, none of us here are nailed to a cross and being executed for some horrible things that we had done. But how often do we go to God and ask him to fix our problems, to make our lives easier, to take care of whatever is ailing us? We start to cry out, God, why are you letting this cancer ravage my body? Father, why are you always allowing me to be underwater and to be in debt? Why are things in the world so out of control? Why aren't you fixing things for me? I mean, if you are the Christ, then save me. The response to those requests is nothing. We might start to think, well, what a failure. But there's one person in the story here we haven't talked about yet. And this one is the most unlikely of heroes in all the scriptures. This is a man whose wickedness and evil deeds had got him condemned to a public execution by the Roman government. And this man, whose life of wickedness, he knows he earned his place on the cross. He knows the other criminals do his deeds as well, but he knows that Jesus is innocent. And so this criminal recognizes the injustice in the situation. You see, he doesn't see Jesus the failure. He sees something quite different. Now, unlike all the others, this criminal was able to see Jesus for who he really is. His death on the cross was not a sign of failure, but a sign of victory. If Jesus had listened to all those other mocks and insults and ridicules and come down from that cross, oh, he would have been a failure. But Jesus didn't. He patiently endured the suffering and the agony because he knew there were myriads of myriads, there were millions and billions of souls desperately in need of salvation. So the cry of the criminal is answered by Jesus from the cross. Now, see, this criminal, he longed for the rescue that only Jesus could provide eternal rescue. So he cried out to his Savior, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
And now at last. The taunts of the synagogue rulers and all the, 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 the mockery of the soldiers were met with silence. But when Jesus hears the humble plea of a soul in need, he answers. What does he say? Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Can you imagine the relief, the comfort that those words brought to that man at that moment? And here's the thing. These are the same words that God speaks to each and every one of us as we confess our sins and receive his forgiveness. He speaks these same words to us as we receive his meal of his body and blood. And he tells us again and again to be at peace. Now, we know in our lives that this is what our souls need to hear. Because we're a lot like that criminal who died next to Jesus. Now, yeah, we don't deserve maybe the whole public execution. But we know we are sinful. None of us here have lived a sinless life. But Jesus did. And he did it for you. You see, God foretold it through Isaiah this way. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Or rather, the way the Apostle Paul describes it, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You see, the purpose of Christ's suffering and dying upon the cross was to give you just that, peace. Unfortunately, peace in this world is so hard to come by because we get so wrapped up in all the other things going on. Like the Jewish religious leaders, we'd like to say, well, you know, Jesus, give us a better life. Make our things simpler and easier. Make all of our problems go away. We like to have our boss give us a raise. We like to have our sp spouse be more loving. We like to have our children be more respectful. We want and we want and we want. You see, Jesus doesn't give us everything we want. But he gives us all things that we need for our salvation. And that is what truly gives us peace. A peace that lasts. Now I began by asking you what you see in the cross. My hope is that what you see and experience is what that criminal on the cross experienced. And that is peace. A peace that isn't the absence of problems or struggles or pain, but it's a confidence that God is with you through it all. It's a peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that only comes through Christ and the blood shed upon the cross. So next time you come into this church and you see the cross, remember that in his death, he wasn't a failure, but he is king. And he is victorious. Because he's not the kind of king that kind of tries to overrule people and nations here in this earth. But he's a king that truly is victorious over the three things that we most struggle. Sin, death, and the devil. You see, this king brings us peace through his death and through his resurrection. And he's the king that will one day say to your souls ardently, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father,